Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Patricia Davidson, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Wollongong in Australia. Our topic is the recent COVID surge affecting her nation. Full disclosure, Dr. Davidson recently served as the Dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, so it was really great to catch up with her. Let's listen. Patricia Davidson, I am so happy to see you, first of all, on Zoom, and grateful for joining Public Health on Call. How are you doing in Australia these days? Well, you know, it's great to be back home in Australia. Uh, I really miss the United States and particularly Hopkins. Um, But Josh, to be honest, I find myself in a bit of Groundhog Day as the pandemic sort of starts to gear up in Australia. Yeah, so you were here in Baltimore with us for most of the pandemic. You've just been in Australia for a couple months now? Yeah, just just almost three months. So, um, you know, I came back to relishing being out and about and no masks, but um, you know, I found myself, uh, we're in, our, in New South Wales in our third week of lockdown and things, the numbers are not, not looking great. So just to orient myself and our listeners, Australia didn't approach COVID the same way the United States did, did it? Yeah. So there are some really unique characteristics of Australia. One is being a big island. <laughs> Um, where it was very easy to lock down the borders. And so essentially that's what that was Australia's uh, posture was to lock down our board, borders. And some people have called this strategy Fortress Australia. As you can imagine, that is not palatable to everybody and also um, has put real challenges. Sorry about the violence. Um, that has had its real you know, challenges for our economy and for universities. Um, One of the really interesting uh, things about Australian universities, largely because of where we're uh, positioned in, you know, in adjacent to Southeast Asia and South Asia and China, that in many universities, um, you know, anything up to 40% of students were international. And because Australian universities are publicly funded, a lot of universities use this strategy of international students to really uh, fund research, which, and in the United States, a lot of that money would traditionally come from philanthropy and foundations and other sources, but that's not as robust in Australia. Yeah, so it it sounds like Australia locked down the borders, kept COVID out, but at a price. Absolutely, absolutely. It's been at the price of our engagement in the broader world. It's been at the price of families united, and it's been at the price of our economy. And the universities have certainly seen that. The universities in particular have seen that. So vaccines become available, um, but not so many find their way to this island? Yes. So um, I think we always have to be, you know, uh, not judgmental of decisions that are made in really complex uh, times. But basically, Australia put all of its money on AstraZeneca as a vaccine. And at the moment, AstraZeneca and Pfizer are the only vaccines being um, administered in Australia. And then the other thing is, importantly, Australia did not have any mRNA domestic capability. So sadly, with AstraZeneca, we know that there are, is an increased risk of thrombocytopenic events. So in the first few weeks of 
the rollout of the vaccine, we have a tragic death of a woman with comorbidities uh, related to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So people, it was a very interesting phenomenon. People sort of were brand shopping like they were for a handbag. And so there really a lot of the country decided that they were just going to wait for Pfizer, and which is coming. But that has been disastrous for us as a nation in terms of moving towards any sort of herd immunity. You know, we are one of the lowest vaccinated countries in the OECD. Now, I remember when you were in Baltimore, even though you were the dean of the nursing school, you were out vaccinating people in the city yourself. Um, And so what's the, I mean, difference between the excitement and the energy of the vaccination effort in the United States and what you've seen arriving in Australia? So firstly, um, I think there's a lot of perception of risk. The low fatality rate, which has been related to closing the borders and lockdowns has meant that people haven't perceived the risk. They've thought, I'm just going to sit it out. And then the other thing is that initially the government uh, wanted to roll out the vaccines through general practitioners, through primary care practitioners. And Josh, you and I have been in those vaccine clinics. We know it's a volume game. So that was number one. Number two, I think they put the general practitioners, the physicians in an awkward place because, you know, whenever there was any controversy, particularly around AstraZeneca, they would say, go talk to your doctor. So I think that dynamic of, you know, sitting across a desk from someone, you know, you don't see there's a lot of COVID around, there is some risks. And so as a consequence, I think many people avoided vaccination. So it's it's almost like a a perverse consequence of how successful Australia was in keeping people from getting sick as people didn't perceive the risk of COVID. In the United States, where people were dying all over the place, they were lining up for the vaccine. Absolutely. That is absolutely correct. And, you know, I've reflected on those times in Baltimore. I think just being together, those mass vaccination activities, going to communities. I think that kind of sense we're all in this together was empowering for individuals because, you know, each and every one of us faced uncertainty. I remember lining up for my vaccine, feeling teary. Firstly, I I had a sense that I'd made it. Um, And like you, we made some tricky decisions during that pandemic. And we didn't know every day that we were making the best decisions. But people in in Australia haven't faced that. So on top of this slow vaccine rollout, you have an unwanted visitor to the island of Australia in the form of the Delta variant. Is that right? Absolutely. But tell me what's happening now. So, you know, Josh... You know, you you can set up the most amazing uh, public health strategies, but you are still, we are still always vulnerable to human behaviours. So one thing that is really impressive in Australia is the public health response. You know, I think yesterday in our state of New South Wales, they did 85,000 tests. You know, every shop you go into, there's a QR code. So you know, that ability throughout the pandemic to monitor contact trace has been very strong. But this, our Delta um, variant came from a limo driver, was the, you know, person zero, who picked up an air crew from the airport. And of course, just this Delta variant is just spread really quickly. And I was actually in that very shopping centre that weekend And the first transmission was literally being in that airspace, not talking to that person, just basically being in the same airspace, in the same shop, within the same time. And so clearly, in spite of our really phenomenal public health efforts and a a community largely that does what they're told, this Delta variant is presenting to be a very formidable opponent. And so now Australia is trying to go back to the same strategy of elimination, right? And closing things down to get rid of the virus. 
Um, but from what we read here, the United States is struggling to be successful. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's, um, as I said, it's a bit like Groundhog Day, uh, where the initial exposure was is in the eastern suburbs. Uh, it's sort of like a tale of two cities. That's the more affluent suburbs. In the western suburbs of Sydney, where there are more multi-generational households, where English is a second language, uh, where um, there's less lower health literacy, that is where it's really taken off and, and ravaging the country. Right. So that, that reminds me of, and reminds you of what happened in the United States. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's responding, the, the government is really trying to rally and setting up mass vaccination centres now. And we're hoping that, you know, the people will feel more confident in the Pfizer vaccine. But it's been a really interesting conversation to be part of that people are treating, as I said, like, um, you know, discriminating between brands of vaccines. Whereas I think in the United States, we had this sense of the best vaccine is the one available on the day. Well, it's, um, it's a difficult moment because you've got to be worried that Australia might fall into the gap between the Delta variant and vaccination. And people aren't that interested in getting vaccinated right now. And the variant really takes hold. It could have a big, big problem. Yeah. And, you know, that is why we're going to see ourselves in lockdown for a protracted period of time. And we all know the devastating effects that has on the economy, on people's lives, you know, just in my team, you know, just those personal things of um, someone's grandmother is dying, they can't be with them, you know, people are having babies, the father can be there immediately for the delivery, but then has to go home. So it's, and of course, all of those ceremonies of life, uh, you know, weddings, funerals, etc., are being cancelled. So I think as well as the physical um, implications, the, uh, you know, social are huge. And when you're talking about lockdowns, you're talking about lockdowns. You're not talking yeah. about the mask mandate that people are calling lockdown. Yeah. And it's really interesting, um, you know, Australia, you've seen what we've done with seatbelts, gun controls, yeah. et cetera. <laughs> you know, socially, we're a country that generally does what they're told. So, yes, literally in lockdowns. And no even talk of social bubbles. <laughs> it's lockdown. Don't see anybody ex external to your household. Um, but that's so challenging, as we know, and we've really seen um, some uh, examples of poor health literacy. And, in fact, I've been going to the Hopkins website, looking at a lot of those resources, and... Mm -hmm. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's just a little bit of sh a shame that we weren't better prepared. But I think there was this sense that we'd beaten it in some way, that we were going to lock down, we would start the vaccination and all would go smoothly. But no one anticipated the adverse event profile of AstraZeneca, which we know intellectually is quite low, but people seeing deaths on the front page of the of the newspaper are, are really challenging. And Australia has a very low appetite for for death. And when you I know many of my colleagues look and say, oh you've only got 23 people in, in ICU in Sydney. What 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 big deal is that? But I think it's just um, part of the culture that people have a low appetite for for death and suffering, and which which speaks a lot to the society, I think, is very positive. Um, but I'm sure as this economic shutdown uh, continues, um, there's going to be more pushback. Well, it's really um, uncharted territory at this point and, and illustrates how the virus finds new ways in every country to cause havoc. Absolutely. And of course, we have to sort of be very chastened to think, you know, what might be the next variant, um, particularly in our neighbourhood part of the world. You know, the, the devastation in Indonesia is just heartbreaking at the moment to see. We see, you know, COVID in Thailand, which had managed to keep 
they lid on for a while, accelerating. We've seen the Sinovax vaccine, which has been, you know, administered in Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries, not demonstrating, um, uh, you know, that it's providing enough protection. And we're seeing the vulnerability of healthcare workers. I think 100 physicians have died in Indonesia just in the last little while. And so for low and middle income countries in our region, um, that's catastrophic. Well, um, I know that our listeners will be thinking about them and you in Australia and really appreciate your time bringing us up to date on the situation across the international date line. Thanks so much, Josh. A pleasure to talk to you and everyone in the US. Please be safe and well as well. well I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.